All right, operations. As a paramedic, your role in operations is going to change significantly from what it was before. And apparently whoever wrote this chapter did not realize that because there's a lot of information in this chapter dealing with operations that are not within your um, focus or your primary job description anymore. Some people will argue that um, somebody is asking, we have an invitation to the new course. Huh? All right. So a lot of the stuff that we're going to be dealing with here in this chapter doesn't have as much to do with you. And so I'll skip through it a bit more. All right. Um, but they will, you will see questions in registry. God awful. God knows why. I do not understand why they think it's necessary to quiz a paramedic on the class of an ambulance you know but whatever so you have your uh, specifications um and then you have your type one two and three so uh remember your type one the cab and the box are completely separated the type two the um is a van type uh, ambulance and then a type three will have the van front with the box connected so an integrated box and cab design um, in case you didn't know there's lots of storage on an ambulance I mean for crying out loud this stuff is like why do we have it in here but it's there it, I will point out that as the paramedic pretty nearly anything that's wrong with that ambulance is going to come back on your shoulders. While you may not be the one at your department who's responsible to repair or resupply uh, the vehicle or even maintenance and inspect it, you are responsible to make certain that you have everything you need before leaving. So whether that's a task delegated to your partner or a task that you perform yourself, you do have the responsibility to ensure that that has everything that, um, on it to meet the state checklist. And states have been known, especially here in the state of Georgia, but multiple other states, have been known to frequently set up spot checks at hospitals where any responding ambulance will get a spot inspection unexpectedly. And uh, if that ambulance is not within guidelines, they're placed out of service. Now imagine trying to explain that to your boss. All right, so yes, we want it to do these four things. Um, these things sound like a little strange thing to be worried about, but to be perfectly honest, I haven't had problems with these four things in the past. Um, while driving with patients. So cool, we're not going to talk about how to check your truck. Um, now staffing there are going to be some questions discussing this and how this all works what decides where ambulances are placed what decides where how many crews or ambulances are needed in a region and these are some of those uh, factors now so private for-profit agencies that's probably what most of well that's what priority is, is a private for-profit agency. Public agencies would be fire-based EMS, but not exclusively. There are some areas that operate a county-based uh, county EMS system that is uh, completely funded by the county, not controlled by a private entity, but is separate from the fire department. So that would be a public agency form. The uh, all other is the public-private partnership. Grady is a really great example of that. Grady is a private hospital with a private ambulance company that has a public partnership and subsidization from 
city of Atlanta and parts of Fulton County where Grady provides services for them. And they have that 911 only division that is uh, funded almost entirely by the, uh, the, the contracted subsidies from the uh, municipalities. So that's an example of public private. I work for a public agency, a fire department, um, and then you guys work for a private agency. I've seen private nonprofit agencies as well, and those would be with like your uh, volunteer departments and stuff. System status management, this is the idea that moves units around the county or places different trucks in service at different times. Um, it's a great idea. It's not always implemented well. It can cause a lot of frustration. That's probably where a lot of your aggravation has come from. Why we got to post out here? Why we got to be out here in BFE and not um, at our station or whatever? But it's because of system status management. All right. So I think this stuff should be pretty um, clear. Why do we? Yeah. Moving along. All right, so now we're starting to get into more where your role is. This is for you preparing to respond, being ready to uh, handle a call. While you're en route to the scene, while these are things you want to do, some of this is kind of obvious, you also want to be thinking, what do I? What am I getting into and what factors are going to be influencing this situation? So do we have weather? You know, is it daytime, nighttime? Is it heavy traffic times, you know, rush hour? Uh, that could impact whether you're, which hospital you will transport to or whether or not you need to call for a helicopter or something like that. So while that one is not always the most accurate with the provided information or the uh, uh, pre-arrival information, we want to try to start making those decisions and thinking ahead. The last thing we want to do is start assuming that we already know what the problem is and um, writing it, the incident off as being uh, non-significant or not important to us because that's when we fall into that complacency trap. All right. So if you're a, you know, especially when you're a new paramedic, if you are en route to a call and you haven't run this type of call recently or ever, pull it up on your phone, review your assessment guidelines, look up your anatomy again, think of your um, path of physiology. You know, if you're, if you've never run a stroke or a pediatric seizure or something like that or maybe you're running for difficulty breathing on a um, patient with cystic fibrosis and you're like what the heck was that um look it up find out what the uh treatments are Con consult your protocols see what recommendations you have that way you kind of walk in with a preparation and you're not caught off guard Obviously, situations change frequently, but be prepared um, if you can. Um, a lot of this question questions are just you know like you're gonna be you're gonna know that. What are you taking in? I think one a big mistake a lot of people make though is choosing not to bring in equipment and then getting caught with their pants down. And you walk in and what sounded like a no big deal fall, you know, patient assist or something like that turns into a cardiac arrest and you don't have your monitor or your jump bag or your suction unit or anything. How many of you, talk to me a little about this, how many of you routinely assign tasks and responsibilities prior to arriving on scene? Is that something that you've seen done? Is it something that you can see yourself doing in some way when you're a beginner, you know, when you're the medic on the truck? If not, why not? Talk to me. What, 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 did, what would your hesitation with this idea be? Okay. 
And when you've been working together for a while and there's a clear understanding, that's very true and it's very helpful. But sometimes different people, I'm sure you've experienced, you've worked with different paramedics and you're, and this one wants to be, the, they want to do the EKG while that one wants to have you set up the EKG and vitals or something like that. And learning each other is important. So communicating, hey, when we walk in the door, I want you to check for um, a pulse and start compressions. Personally, if I'm running with two man crew and I'm walking in the door on a, what maybe, you know, appears to be a cardiac arrest, I want to check for the pulse and I want to start the compressions. Why? Because compressions are something I can do without thinking about them. So while I'm sitting there pumping away on the chest, I can be looking at my partner like, hey, get this out, do this, get that. Oh, look at the monitor. Yep, that's what that is. And the whole time I'm being useful by compre doing the compressions. Like I don't get tunnel visioned on doing the compressions i can still run the call while or you know run the arrest while doing the compressions so that's uh you know something to think about when you're a beginner medic you may not have that luxury you may not have that um skill and comfortability with that yet all right so um yeah you got to make sure everything's secure in the ambulance you want to damage your equipment but really you don't want those things becoming projectiles in the event of an accident and hitting you in the head and that stuff has happened before all right we know how to arrive on scene look for hazards blah blah, blah. this is your standard stuff right nothing new here it's basically straight through your assessment uh policy Oh, make sure that you ignore the bleeding patient to put reflectors on the ground, okay? Make certain that you put your reflectors out on the ground. Let the patient bleed out. That's okay. All right, don't worry about that. And then get them on the other side of the crash too for where the cars are driving away from you. Yeah, I know. And most of our trucks don't have them. Some of our engines, I mean, our engines all have cones, but our ambulances don't. Yeah. And really, that gets the job done. Like, there's, you know. Let the fire truck block the traffic for you. Um, if you work with the fire department re routinely, be familiar with their... Uh, incident scene policies you know where do they park their apparatus what's where are they going to want you to park routinely ideally you want to go past the scene especially on the interstate and be on the downstream side so that once your patient loaded you can leave the scene immediately and you're not trying to uh, thread your way through traffic and get off the scene also while you want while the idea of protecting the scene with the apparatus is a great idea if your ambulance gets rear-ended now you don't have that ambulance and you're not able to take care of that patient or transport anymore so another good reason to have your ambulance downstream when possible have the ambulance downstream however there are times where it's only you responding to an incident on the side of the road in which you will use your ambulance as a deflector as the guard to protect the scene and then you'll park uh upstream of the scene in between oncoming traffic and the scene to um and just hope that you don't get hit it says three straps on this one keep in mind if your stretcher has five straps and you've only used three you can be held liable for the injuries to that patient the rule of thumb is you use every strap made available to you. No, I don't. Was that recent? I mean, I've seen tons of different um, videos of people dropping, you know, it's like, oh, look, it's an AMR recruitment video. But...
Oops. All right, after the run, you are responsible for making certain that you're ready to go for the next run. While we would all love to go 10-7 or out of service for decontamination and restock for an hour after every call we run, it's not always feasible, but it is important that we clean up and be ready for our next, um, be deconned for the next run. So. 6,000 crashes with uh, with emergency response vehicles. Not all of those are fatal. Some of them don't have injuries. Most of the damage is caused by backing um, accidents where people back into something very minor. Um, but be familiar with the truck. Now, you're not even going to be the one driving most of the time, so we're not going to get too heavy into this. But I will point out... The state laws look at the paramedic as being the deciding factor as to whether or not that unit will respond emergency. I realize that most departments have a policy about, you know, written by their medical director and their supervisors about when you will or will not respond emergency. In some departments, the policy is written anytime you're responding to a call, you respond emergency, period. Lights and sirens. Some departments even have it. If you're transporting, you're transporting emergency. I really hope that that doesn't exist anymore, but it has existed in the past. Um, I'm not a huge fan of that kind of an idea. Um, sometimes states will make specific rules. For example, Pennsylvania had a rule that if you were responding to a call at a healthcare facility or any location where there were um, on staff medical providers, healthcare providers, uh, or personnel, you do not respond emergency. So nursing home, clinics, doctor's offices, um, hospital ERs, interfacility transfers, you do not respond to the call emergency when there's healthcare people on scene. Kind of makes sense. But then of course the joke always came around, well, does the nursing home actually count as healthcare workers? Or, or no, no, the word was healthcare professionals. Does the nursing home really count? But um, ultimately, in the event of an incident where the ambulance was responding emergency and an accident happens, the decision to respond or the responsibility of res um, re responding in an emergency manner will come back on the paramedic. Even though the part their partner may have been the one driving, the paramedic is the one who will had who had the decision or the ultimate responsibility to decide whether the call required emergent transport. What does that mean if your department requires you to respond emergency to all calls? That was a question. What does that mean when your department respond, requires you to respond to emergency to all calls? Okay. So how can we make them both happy? Yeah. That is where the paramedic could be like, look, I know we have to have the lights on and the siren on, but you can stop driving over the speed limit. You can stop being a fool or you can s realize that this person has got a hangnail and they don't need us killing somebody to get there. So take it easy. While you are requiring you, you are required to go emergency and you're meeting that requirement, you're stopping um you're completely stopping at your intersections. You are looking both ways. You are driving within the speed limit. You're not shoving people out of the way. You are being as cautious and careful as possible. You are not balls to the walls trying to get to the scene. Um, my department has uh, left it completely in the uh, at, to the discretion of the crew. Um, there's been some cases where we got uh, chewed out for not going emergency when maybe when people felt like we should have in hindsight. And we just kind of look at them and we're like, 
the information we had at the moment did not seem to warrant an emergency response. It was in the best interest of us and everyone on the road to be safe and not respond to emergency. So you defend it that way. All right, so not gonna waste time on driver's characteristics. Be familiar with your zones. If your partner is new to the area, get them out and drive. Also, keep them from using their GPS as much as possible when you're when it's not when you're not on a call when it's not absolutely necessary. And the reason I say that is we get dependent on the GPS to tell us where to go. <laughs> I'm not denying there's still lots of addresses I look up. Man, I've never been on that road before. Uh, let me look this one up. Right now, I'm in a new zone. I've only been there a few months. I'm still learning that zone. That's okay. But looking at your GPS for every single call and every transport to the hospital keeps you from thinking and recognizing the roadways and re um, understanding the concept of where you're turning. And so then when technology isn't available or... Uh, road conditions change, you're not going to be able to adapt to the new circumstance. So try to keep your partner as familiar and um, non-reliant on technology as possible. Wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to um, drive or work when we were fatigued? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Um, yeah, we're tired. We're placing the unit out of service. Yeah. Such idealists write these books. Now, something here to keep in mind. Um, distractions. In the flight world, whether it's flight EMS or, you know, any form of um, flight training, pilots and co-pilots are taught a process called sterile cockpit. Sterile cockpit is during takeoff and landing, there is no conversation, there is no noise, um, there is no uh, music or radio or anything going on within that aircraft, within that cockpit, or within the crew on the PA that isn't related directly to the operation of the uh, vehicle. Anybody on, that, on the headset, so like if you're talking to like a flight crew on an air medical ambulance, everybody's looking outside. If you're, uh, you know, in the aircraft, like in commercial flights, the pilot and the co-pilot, they're all eyes are outside. Nobody's looking at the their checkbooks or anything or um, checklists or their computer. This idea is that when you're taking off and landing in those aircraft, there are no distractions. And the only time somebody's going to say something is if a hazard is noted. In a similar sense, we should be using that concept, the sterile cockpit idea, while responding to calls, especially emergency. Anytime we get to an intersection uh, or a, a high traffic area, school zone, or something like that, all eyes should be outside of the vehicle and only noise and conversation taking place should be pointing out hazards. Basically, anticipate the other drivers are not going to know what to do. All right. You're, you got a new EMT partner, and they're green, and they've never driven anything bigger than a Prius. Get them out there and backing around a parking lot for a while. Make them get familiar with the vehicle and its size because it's not uncommon for this to happen. Though We get new hires who have never seen anything bigger than their sedan or their coupe. Only one person should be doing the backing. You should not have more than one backer. That gets confusing. I've already discussed parking on the emergency scene. Nothing too 
uh, crazy or concerning there. If you're pointing towards oncoming traffic, lowering your headlights, uh, making sure you don't have your high beams on, or if possible, turning your headlights off and just having your running lights on can be helpful. Bright white lights pointing in the direction or pointing at oncoming traffic tends to blind them and makes it harder for them to see you walking around the ambulance. <clears throat> Here in the state of Georgia, you are required to always have your ANSI tearaway vest on when you are on scene of a roadway. Um, there are different ways of interpreting that i've heard that said that if your vehicle is on a road and you get out of the vehicle you need to have your vest on but i've also heard it said like if you're parking on a dry, on the sidewalk or a side of the road in a neighborhood to go into the house or whatever that's not the incident is not on the road but if the incident itself is on the roadway or on the shoulder of the road that's when you need to have your safety vest on because if you wear, wear that safety vest, no car can hit you. Or if it does, you will be perfectly fine. There will be no injuries because that is a car-proof vest. All right. Um, sure. Moving along. Yeah, I always recommend don't touch the brakes if you're hydroplaning uh steer very gently um do not ex you you can accelerate but do not accelerate aggressively um but i recommend just take your foot off the accelerator and um just ride it. don't don't because when you start hitting the brakes whether you're on hydroplaning in water or on ice that's what's going to cause the tires to break loose and you'll lose traction All right. Um, so what is the right of way? Here in the state of Georgia, emergency vehicle operations and lights and sirens are requesting a right of way. It is not demanding a, um, people to get out of our way. People do not have to yield to us. They are instructed to yield to us but we cannot force them over and we cannot run red lights and we cannot um exceed the speed limit outside of the recommendation or outside of the policy in which in the state of georgia is 10 miles we are allowed to travel at 10 miles above the posted speed limit if the road conditions allow already talked about warning lights i'm not a fan of escorts i do not recommend that you use escorts unless you're in like a super urban area where you have enough escort vehicles to shut down and block intersections so that you can continue through having escorts is actually really dangerous because other drivers hear sirens they see the police car come through the intersection and they think, well, there's the police car. That siren I hear was that police car and they continue out and then you come in and hit them because you were right behind the police car. This has happened over and over again. Make certain that you give a very long following distance between you and the next emergency vehicle if you're both responding to the same location. You don't want to be close to their tail where somebody's going to miss that you exist and run into you or pull out in front of you for this reason escorts are not a great idea and then family members i always tell them to take a different route or um i if possible i try to send them on the road first say hey you we're gonna be here a minute you go to the hospital you you start heading that way you'll be there when we get there unpaved roads in a rural setting well, that's where you're there to have fun right get that thing sideways mm, yeah i think we should all know this uh school zones school buses 
This one right here on funeral possessions is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. I, I do not even understand how this is a thing anymore. I'm like, really? Like, your person's dead. Ours is dying. Get out of the way. Ours is still alive. I, I, I don't get it. But. All right. So now we're going to get into the use and function of air medical transport. This is going to be a lot more about what your decisions have to be and how you're going to handle the situation in the field. All right. What do you need to consider? When do you call for a helicopter? Helicopters are an excellent tool. They're extremely expensive, but they can be a very, um, they can make a huge difference in the patient's outcome. So what is the reason for it? When the patient requires transport to a facility for a time sensitive condition, and that helicopter can get it um, more expedient. Um, you can get there faster in the helicopter than by ground. That isn't always the case though. For example, if you live, if you're working in Roswell, calling a helicopter to get into Atlanta may not be faster because you have to wait for the helicopter to get into the air, wait for the helicopter to fly to the scene, wait for the helicopter to land. And then once they're on the ground, they have a 10 minute scene time, just like you did. Then they load the patient, then they fly to the hospital, then they land on the roof and carry the patient all the way to the trauma center at the, or the CT on the ground floor. So You've got to think about that whole time frame. Is that $50,000 helicopter bill going to be worthwhile and make a difference for this patient? Now, you live out on the county, you know, out in the uh, rural area, you know, way out in Athens or um, like around here, you live out in Heard County is what we would say, or Harrelson, where you're an hour, easily an hour minimum to Atlanta, and that's with no traffic. Uh, none of the local hospitals or stroke centers or uh, comprehensive or trauma centers. Yeah, you're going to call the helicopter to the scene because even if that helicopter takes 15 minutes to get to the scene, it's still going to get the patient to definitive care faster. Another circumstance to call a helicopter is when there are no other ALS units available. In some rural communities, a BLS fire department will utilize an ALS helicopter service so that the patient can be transported to a uh, definitive care faster without having to wait for an ambulance to show up on scene. Now, this is extremely rural areas. But you really got to think, will it save time? And most of the time, if you wait till you're on scene, I've assessed the patient or possibly even extricated them from the car wreck or something, and you wait that long to call for the helicopter, it probably isn't going to be saving time. So carefully think that through. What's our time window to deal with STEMIs or strokes? You know, how much time? What's the what's the recommended time window for strokes and STEMIs for treatment? Yep, strokes we want to see treatment within three hours onset of symptoms. Some places have pushed that out to six hours. Um, the uh, comprehensive stroke centers with the thrombol. Um, Removal of clots and such like that, the surgical removal of clots, they're able to push the strokes out to 8, 9, 10, 12 hours. It's really impressive, but in general, if you're using TPA, you're looking at that three to six hour window. STEMIs, they want that re uh, reversed within 90 minutes. And then with trauma, you think the golden hour, 60 minutes to definitive care. Not 60 minutes to the local hospital, 60 minutes to surgery. All right, so rotary wing, this is what we deal with most frequently because they land on the scene, they're short distance transports, but there are fixed wing. I've had several opportunities to assist with uh, fixed wing transports where we would pick the flight crew up take at the airport, take them to the hospital, 
load the patient up, transport them to the um, airport, and assist them with loading in the aircraft. These are interstate, you know, patient was on vacation in California, now they want to fly back home for a surgery in New York or something like that. All right, so um, this is going to be confusing to some of your questions. Notice this question here. Why would you use it or an advantage of using it? Availability of medical crew with advanced skills and equipment. Advanced skills, meaning that they have been trained and certified to do things that you are not certified to do. Make sense? Here in the state of Georgia, that might be RSI, that might be uh, uh, CRIC, or um, in other states, that might include things like chest tubes and such like that. These are some of the reasons not to use a helicopter or problems with using a helicopter, I should say. But one of the things that you do not want to call a helicopter for is because you think they have more experience. Experience and skills are not the same thing. They may be better at their skills, but if you are capable of the same skill, then that's not a reason for you to call the helicopter. So here's your reasons. Can't do ground transport. It's gonna to be too far, too long. Uh, they need care that you're not able to provide or there's too many patients going to the local hospital, so we need a helicopter to take them to another hospital further away. All right, I'm not really gonna spend any time talking about how to establish the landing zone. You want a clear area, you don't want any debris, that's all great. You're going to be taking care of the patient. It is not your responsibility to worry about where the landing zone is, all right? 60 by 60 is your minimum, great, cool, nice. Um, do not approach the aircraft without direct in direction from the crew, all right? When you're approaching the aircraft, always approach from the front so that the pilot can see you until they indicate you to move to the side. You will, from a distance, you will approach the aircraft from the front so that the crew can make eye contact with you. And then when you actually walk up to the aircraft and get within the zone of the rotors, you will come in from the side. Approaching all the way from the front, like all the way up to the aircraft from the front can be dangerous. Being on the uphill side of the aircraft will be dangerous. So here you can see the pilot's view area. You want to approach in that view until they tell you to move around to the side. Um, it's cool to load people in aircraft. Everybody wants to be there when there's doing a hot load on a trauma patient or something. The minimum number of people possible need to be up there. And somebody, preferably two people, should always have at least one hand on the stretcher. Never let the stretcher be um, on its own because that rotor will blow it away and the next thing you know it'll be in the tail rotor and that aircraft is grounded and now you're ground pounding the patient. So this is showing how with wind depending on how the pilot's holding the, um, the cyclic stick that front rotor may come low to the ground. Don't do this. Don't try to tell the hel aircraft, um, the pilot, what to do and where to move. Um, these guys are highly trained. They're really good at figuring out where they need to land. They don't need you to direct them. Already pointed this out. I'm not really sure why you have open flames, um, but you know, there are, I do know that people use, used to use flares. Occasionally we'll see flares on a roadway. You just don't want those near the um, aircraft. Hopefully you know, never shine a light or a laser at an aircraft. And then this is what I was saying. If the aircraft is on uneven ground, always approach from the downhill side. Do not approach from the uphill side. It's just putting you closer to the rotors.
Um, if you have hazardous materials on scene, the aircraft needs to be notified. If there's fire or smoke on scene, um, notify them early so they know how to approach the scene, which side of the smoke column they want you on. They will know north, south, east, or west. Um, again, if you're taking care of the patient, this isn't your responsibility. This will be incident commands. Uh, or your transport supervisor or something like that. However, the day may come when you're that transport supervisor, you're in charge of the transport sector of a mass casualty and you'll have to co coordinate with the helicopters and where you want them to land. All right, so that pretty much wraps that chapter. It wasn't a big one, um, but... Um,